Okay, go ahead, Brenda. All right, let's go before the Father in prayer. Holy and righteous God, our Father, first and foremost, God, we come to say thank you, Father God. God, we thank you for life itself, for the ability to live, move, breathe, and have our being. But, Father God, more than anything, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for our sins, Father God. Mm -hmm. Father, as we've come on this Monday evening, Father God, thank you for another brand new week, Father God. We thank you for this discipleship class and fellowship, and we thank you for what you've already poured into Brother Brady, Father God. We pray, Father God, that as he pours into us, Father God, we have a listening ears, Father God, ready to receive what he has for us, Father God, on a topic of worship, within, worship within uh, within service, worship within the, in the ministry and, and, and music and how we can worship you in spirit and in truth, Father God. For we know your word says to let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So, Father God, as we continue to worship you, as we continue to come close to you, Father God, we pray that we have a listening ear to understand what Brother Brady has studied, mm -hmm. Father God. Allow him to readily co collect the things that he's studied that you've given him, Father God. Allow it to be at the forefront of his mind that we're able to receive that and we're able to worship you even greater than we did last Sunday, Father God. We're, our prayer is that every Sunday our worship is much greater, Father God. Every Sunday our worship is much closer to you, Father God. We give you glory, honor, and praise, Father God, acknowledging not only the worship happens on Sunday, but it should happen every day of the week, God. Mm -hmm. But God, we thank you, Father God, for the worship that's going to come out of today's discipleship class, Father God. And we give you glory, honor, and praise right now for what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, appreciate that prayer, Brendan. And uh, thank you all for being on here uh, this uh, this evening, rather. I, I, I was telling myself, you know, I was putting the lesson together. Uh, I said, this may be my best one yet. God, you, you, you working in me. <laughs> uh, I, know, I know the last one we had, uh, we had some questions on the last one, boy, which was good, though, but it was good that we had questions because I believe in uh, giving people, uh, you know, biblical answers uh, when there's a, a, a you know, Q&A for, for, for around the Bible. So, but no, I, I really believe, family, that um, this is, if, the, if you are, if you, you know, you know, a lot of people are sure they have a they have a good understanding why, you know, the what, how, and why when it comes to music and worship, um, especially those who will, I like to call uh, biblical enthusiasts, they understand, you know, you know why we do it right, and and then also too, uh, they can really prove biblically, you know, you know why we do that practice. Okay, um, but there are a number of people in the church who are unsure. Okay. And there are a number of people in the church who are not really uh, don't fully understand the role of music uh, in worship. So that's why I want to put this together, family, uh, this D2 class to kind of do this today, tonight. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Let me say this. If you have any questions, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to monitor the, the chat the best I can, but usually I'll try to do the Q&A at the end. Uh, if you have any biblical questions also that are not related to this topic, they're definitely going to be, uh, we're going to go ahead and table those to the end as well. But I definitely want to make sure, though, that if anybody have any questions from, from the subject matter to, uh, today, uh, you know, definitely ask, ask your question for sure. Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And uh, let me know if you can see this. I did send this on earlier. Can y'all can y'all see this? Mm -hmm. Is it big enough? Or I need to make it bigger. You need to make it a little bigger. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Or should I make this bigger? Let's see here. Make the window. How about that? Is that better? Yeah, that's good. Okay, okay. I can really see it over here. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's talk about the role of music in worship, all right? Um, I'm going to highlight, what I'm going to do is, th there's a lot of information that I have here. Um, I don't want to go through everything verbatim, but I definitely want to highlight, I believe, that are important or notable areas. Um, and so that's what I'll do. Uh, if anybody at the end of the Q&A wants to go back to a section, we definitely can do that. We can definitely revisit if need be. 
Music has played a, a central role in Christian worship from its earliest days, serving as a powerful medium for expressing faith, uh, enhancing communal worship or corporate worship or, you know, assembly worship and deepening spiritual experiences. Okay. And so we're going to dive into this exploration of this um, multifaceted thing when it comes to Christian uh, music and Christian worship. Okay. All right. And so I'll let you read. That's kind of more to the intro. Okay. Um, but one thing I do like is that, you know, we when you think about music and worship, right, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Uh, it's biblical foundational foundations, it the, its theological significance, and practical applications highlights its enduring, enduring importance of the life of the church. Um, through music, believers across generations and cultures can express their faith, learn and internalize scriptural truths, and engage in heartfelt worship to God. So if you was wondering, worship is, I mean, music is important, right? Every act of worship that we do, I know that from, from a Church of Christ perspective, we know we focus on the five acts of worship. Now, there's more acts of worship than five, but I know we focus on that. And But music, um, singing, uh, right, is it plays is a very it's a it's a big part of worship. Um, and if you go anywhere, any church, any congregation has a really good uh, uh, program or or has a uh, have a history of singing very well. Right. They had that that alone has drawn a lot of people uh, because people, you know, they really resonate. Right. And identify through singing, right, through the music of worship, okay? Let's talk about the his, historical foundation, all right? So, again, it can be traced back to the Old Testament, right? The Psalms serving as the hymn book of Israel. And so if anybody, you know, there's 150 Psalms, and, and if anybody ever want to know what those different divisions were, they're basically hymns, okay? They actually, um, they, they song or sing those actual words right it's basically a song book um and so uh some people don't know that that's a good that's important to know family that for those who don't know that psalms is a it's a it's a hymnal okay so when david or or um others who could they wrote i think they wrote half of them but david or others who wrote those they were uh singing those those words right in mind when they when they wrote those things um, they wrote those words in Psalms. Uh, early church practices, the early Christian church influenced by Jewish synagogue traditions incorporated psalm singing in hymns. The emphasis was on a vocal was on vocal music, often a cappella, due to the simplicity of early worship settings and the need for portable and easily conducted services. And so another thing why this is important for us to know, family, is that it's good to know the, the history of the church and then general church history, right? Right, which we'll deal with later. When did, right, instruments become part of just Christian worship in general, all right? We're gonna talk about that as well. We'll talk about the different centuries it was introduced in, okay? But this is good to know, right? Because, you know, as we, one thing one thing I find in my ministry and in, in those who, who come across, who teach, right? And those who get asked the question, why do y'all have only acapella music, right? Why y'all don't have instruments, right? Um, and 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 the big thing is a lot of times we'll say, right, you know, it's not, it's uh it's not in the Bible. Some people say it's a sin, right? And we're gonna talk about all those things, right? Okay, but it's good to know and it's good to be able to defend, you know, you know, what we do and why we do it, right? And then how also we can tie the Bible into what we do, right? Um, theological significance, okay? Um, expression of praise and adoration. Music is a primary means of expressing praise and adoration to God through singing. Believers can believers articulate their worship, gratitude, and reverence for God. The Psalms frequently exhort the, uh, the faithful to sing to the Lord as an act of worship, okay? So singing, as we know, is, is what an express is expressive. We know in Colossians 3, 16, you know, through singing, we can teach and we can admonish, okay? And also, too, it's about spiritual edification, right? You know, there have been songs that have, you know, have, have a night need to do better 
for God. There have been songs that have led me to confess sin, right? You know, there are songs that uh, have triggered, you know, that, that inward, right, introspection, right? You know, especially like for, like, for example, communion. We sing a communion song, and depending on what song they sing, family, it can really touch you, right? And moments in worship okay okay practical functions okay enhancing liturgy okay liturgy just basically means you know the 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 order of worship how you how you do public worship okay so in many christian traditions music enhances the uh the liturgical elements of worship it accompanies it accompanies prayers readings and sacraments providing a dynamic and engaging worship experience now when i put that together that's just in general okay right we'll get to the coc stuff in a minute but i just wanted to let you know that's just in general okay For facilitating participation music invites active participation from the congregation people don't know how don't, don't need to know the bible right i'm just, I'm just let me rephrase it People don't, not have, don't necessarily have to know the Bible, but they, they definitely can engage in singing, right? For example, somebody might not know exactly what they, you know, we say go to Colossians 2 and 15. They may not be astute yet right on that, right? Um, maybe somebody, we stand and we we pray, and maybe uh, somebody might not be used uh, to, to prayer, right? Right, or something, some element in worship that that may be kind of foreign to them. But usually, singing is pretty basic and simplistic. Okay, now I don't understand why my especially Christian folks we don't be singing, especially we've been around the Lord for a long time. Amen. Walls and windows, right? Because we're supposed to sing. Okay, and everybody's supposed to sing. And so, uh, but but singing, you know, you know, when I look at this, right, uh, you know, it really. It really bolsters, you know, the worship experience. Singing really uh, gets, it can galvanize people, right? It can make people, uh, ignite them in their mind, uh, really to to elevate, you know, you know, their, their, you know, what they're doing, going through in worship, okay? Creating atmosphere, right? Music sets the tone, atmosphere for worship, okay? Amen. Different styles and tempos can evoke various emotional responses. Um, from solemn reflection during a confession to exuberant joy during a celebration. There's a reason why we sing an upbeat song during giving. I say it, amen. <laughs> There's a reason why we sing a song during a more what, somber song in communion, because why? It's more about reflection, okay? And so, you know, again, going back, music, you know, in that purpose, it can, it can be a tone setter, Okay. You know, diversity in worship styles, you can read this on your own family, but you can read over here, traditional, contemporary blends, okay? Uh, I got here, uh, uh, cultural expression, okay? Now, this is really why I really want to get into here, the Church of Christ versus the, the Disciples of Christ. Now, why am I talking about this? Because both, well, let me say this. Look, I'm not. I'm, I, I give credit to Alexander Campbell on um, some of the things he did, but Alexander Campbell ain't the Church of Christ. Okay, the Church of Christ has been here since the first century. All right, Jesus, Jesus Christ is the one who started the Church of Christ. But you know, I, but I will give credit to Alexander Campbell and Thomas Candle, his brother, for for the work that they did. Right. Um, but the reason why I want to kind of say that because some people in some circles they put a they, they Put a whole lot on them like they are you know, the ones who really start the church that's why sometimes you hear people call church of christ people campbellites okay right? i'm sure you heard that before um but they say that because a lot of times we put too much emphasis on it we want to celebrate what they did but we don't want to make sure that they what they replace who the real designer architect right and the one who died for the church okay which is jesus amen all right but out of their movement, they had a, they had a restoration movement. And all of what it was is, and let me say this: there have been there have been multiple res, restoration movements in, in history. Now I'm not gonna. That's not the that's not the subject of our discipleship class tonight. But but there have been multiple ones, right? They put together one. There have been one other ones in England. Uh, there also uh, there you know Martin Luther. You know he had a big one, right? With going against the Catholic Church, and so there have been there have been 
a, a multiplicity of different restoration movements, okay? Out of the restoration movement really came two thoughts when it comes to congregations or a way to do the way to do church and worship style. We have the Church of Christ, and we also have the Disciples of Christ. Now, the Disciples of Christ are still here today, okay? I'm sure if you go around, you look them up on Google, and uh, uh, you, uh, you may come across one uh, here on, on Facebook or maybe driving, you may run into one, right? But they're still here, okay? And there are differences between those two. Because what happened was out of the restoration movement, you had two different camps, right? And one camp wanted to focus on one thing and another camp, which was Alexander Campbell, wanted to focus on something totally different, okay? Now, Alexander Campbell, for those who know, came out of the Presbyterian Church, right? A lot of his, um, the doctrinal tenets that came from there Right, were infused uh, or, or, or really highlighted, uh, you know, or I'm gonna say that this some of the things that were transferable, right? That were transferable biblical, that was right, but were taken a lot from the Presbyterian Church, especially when it comes to the, the way they, they view elders. Um, but anyway, but let me just let's talk about the key differences though. So, because we're dealing with music today, right? Some of the key differences was worship style, okay? All right, so the worship style of disciples of christ jerry allowed the use of instrumental music in worship okay all right and you can see here they are more open to various forms of worship and liturgy okay coc right that's us right okay generally churches of christ do not use instrumental music in worship services they practice a cappella singing believing that the new testament specifies this form of worship and remember uh, those in the call today, those on, on, on this lesson, um, one of the things I like I like to celebrate and champion is that we're trying to be the New Testament church, okay? And that right there is key when we talk to people. When I talk to people, say, who come out of different churches or people who are, just say the people who are unchurched, right? They don't know anything about the Church of Christ. And then they sometimes they come out later and say, well, why? I noticed that, you know, just noticing y'all worship. Y'all don't have acapella music. And I said, yeah, I said, like communion, like we do first of the, the first day of the week, right? Uh, like how we do our giving, right? Like how we view love, like how we view forgiveness and other biblical elements or command, biblical principles or commands, right? We try to adhere to first century standard, okay? New Testament church standards. And that's important. And even when it comes to music in the church, right? The Old Testament, I like to point out to the Old Testament was different, okay? Versus the New Testament, because in the Old Testament, right, they did have had instrumental music in the worship. But in the New Testament, in the New Testament church standard, the emphasis and the example points to singing, okay? A cappella singing. So, so that's why I wanted to point that out, because people a lot of times they'll ask that question to me, um, you know, especially you know, the last, I've had that question said a lot of times, especially the last couple of years, but, mm -hmm. but it's over the course of my ministry. I'm sure you have too, family, those who come, who, mm -hmm. who teach or who talk to other people, right? But it's important that we, that we truly give them an answer that's biblically correct. Okay. All right. I want to point that out. All right. And now that you read the difference, there, there's, there's different, there's other differences there. There's, not just worship style, there's doctrinal tenant differences, the church governance differences, right? I'll let you read that uh, in your own time, all right? But those are the key the key differences, right? The instrumental music, the theological approach, and the governance, all right? All right, what does the Bible say about music in the Old Testament? Instrumental music, instrumental music is frequently mentioned and allowed in the Old Testament, especially in the context of worship and praise, okay, it's all over the, the Old Testament, right, right, and that's a lot of time you get that, they'll say, well, it was in, it's in the Bible, I always like to say, what part of the Bible, <laughs> amen, right, and the Bible got two main parts, right, but Psalms 150 through the five, right, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and the lyric, praise him with the, the timbrel and the, the dancing, praise him with the strings and the pipe, Praise him with the clash of symbols. Praise him with the resounding symbols. Right. So we we see here that uh, that you know it, it's referred to here, right, in Psalms, Second Samuel six and five. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, temples, sistrums, and cymbals, all instruments. Okay. 
First Chronicles 13, 8. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs, with harps, lyrics, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. Okay. First Chronicles 15 and 6, day 16. David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their fellow Levites as musicians to make a joyful sound with musical instruments, lyrics, harps, and cymbals. Okay. And I go on and on about how each of these different scriptures, right? Point to or refer to not only worship and praise, but also the incorporation of musical instruments in the worship. And, 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 for, and for my Nehemiah fans in the house today, watch this, right? Nehemiah 12 and 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, right? Remember after 52 days, they were able to rebuild the wall. The Levites were uh, sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving. And with the music of cymbals, harps, and livers. So, in other, other words, family, the Old Testament has instrument music all over it, right? And so, and that's one of the big reasons uh, why people, you know, different churches have instruments because of the Old Testament and their view on the New Testament, okay? Okay, we're going to deal with that here in a little bit, okay? God's displeasure with Israel's worship, okay? In the Old Testament, God just expressed Displeasure with Israel's worship practice including their use of instrumental music, particularly when their worship was insincere or hypocritical. Okay, so here are some key passages. I'll read one of the big ones. Amos 5 and 23. God says, take away from me the noise of your songs. Oh, now listen to your music of your harp. This indicates that God was not pleased with their musical worship because it was not accompanied by justice and righteous. Remember, one of the the, the prophetic mandates that Amos had when he had to go go and uh, prophesize to Israel was that, remember, at this time, Israel had lost their way from a moral perspective, okay? And so they were still trying to go to the Moses and worship, and God said, y'all haven't got your hearts right, right? And let me say this, family, right? That's why it's important that when we worship, right, it doesn't matter what we have in the building, it doesn't matter what act of worship we do. It doesn't matter what order of service we have. If our heart is not right, the worship is not right. Okay. Isaiah 111 and 15, God questioned the purpose of this sacrifice and offering, saying, He is fed up with burnt offering and does not delight in the blood of animals. He criticized the observance of new moons and Sabbaths, called their assemblies uh, iniquity. Despite their many prayers, He will not listen as their hands are full of blood, indicating their sinful action. Okay. Amos 6, 5 through 7, God condemns those who play music and invent instruments like David, yet indulge in lux luxury living, a luxurious living, and are not concerned about the suffering of others. As a result, they will be among the first to go into exile, and their revelry will end. Now, these passages do not show God's displeasure with, with instrumental music by itself, okay? but with the people's hip, uh, hypocritical worship and sinful behavior. One of the big things I hear all the time, even from us, is that, well, God wasn't pleased uh, with the instruments. Well, if you take the, the, the context of what God was saying, God wasn't, wasn't pleased with their worship, period, okay? It didn't matter if they sung, it didn't matter about the sacrifice, it didn't matter what they did, right? Because if their heart wasn't right, right, uh, then whatever, no matter what they did, sung, read the word, use instruments, none of that stuff is what's going to be right also as well, okay? And so a lot of times I know we point to that and say, you know, that's the reason why we shouldn't have it. No, God allowed this in the Old Testament, okay? All right, this was allowed in the Old Testament, okay? Music in the New Testament. What does the Bible say, all right? In Ephesians 5 and 19, y'all know this one, right? Most of y'all do. Believers are encouraged to communicate with each other using psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in their heart towards the Lord. Okay, y'all know Colossians 3, 16, right? Talking about teaching and admonishing. James 5 and 13 suggests those who are cheerful should sing psalms. 1 Corinthians 14 and 15 highlights the practice of singing with the spiritual, what, understanding alongside praying in the same manner. Acts 16, 25, right? Recounts at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang hymns. So what does this mean, family? So all these, all these verses and throughout the New Testament, remember, like I said, in the Old Testament, right, you have literally throughout the Old Testament different scriptural references pointing to worship and praise with the incorporation of instrumental music. But in the New Testament, it's different, okay? The emphasis is more on what? Singing, right? 
and incorporating a cappella singing in what worship and praise in the New Testament and in the New Testament church. And even, you know, when you look at, right, somebody says, well, well, it, it says for us, to, it commands us to sing. It does, but not just in church. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16 means to sing in everyday life, okay? So we ought to be singing, you know, every day, right? Right. You don't. You shouldn't have to wait until the opening prayer service, right, to get your hymnal out <laughs> and start singing, amen, right? Everybody on this call, I believe, have a, a go-to song that they go to. They whip out when they when they going through something, right? When somebody getting on your last nerve, when somebody ain't doing you right, when you feel disrespected, when you feel like people misuse you and, and who are treacherously doing you wrong, right? We got a song we go to, right? When you go through what you go through, right? We all have a go-to. Like we have a go-to scripture. All of us have a go-to song. Amen? And so, but anyway, I just want to reiterate again that the New Testament emphasizes, right, not just through command, but also a biblical example, it emphasizes the practice of singing, okay? What does acapella mean, okay? comes back from an Italian word in the style of the chapel, okay? Meaning in, meaning A, meaning in, and capella, meaning chapel or choir. In musical context, it refers to vocal music performed without instrumental accompaniment, okay? This the term is often used to describe choral, uh, choral music sung without any background music, relying solely on the voices of the singers to create the melody, harmony, and rhythm. Acapella can be found in various musical genres and styles, ranging from classical, religious musical, religious, religious music to contemporary and pop music. It emphasizes the purity of the human voice and often showcases the singer's ability to harmonize and create uh, intricate vocal arrangements. Amen. In today's today's uh, world, right, all these singers today they got they got auto tune, they got all kinds of little things to help them sing, right. But, but the real singers are the ones that can sing acapella at, at a concert, right? Uh, the real singers, you know, when they sound, when you go to a concert, they sound like they sound, they're like, oh, they sound like they sound in the studio. They can sing. <laughs> and you usually get that when they start singing what? Acapella. Amen. All right. The command to sing. Let's talk about it. The New Testament uh, contains several passages that encourage believers to sing as a form of worship and mutual edif edification. We already talked about Ephesians 5 and 19, right? Okay. Talk about clock 3, 16. This is kind of like almost like a repeat, but I just write some things a little bit different, explaining the verse. I'll let you read this in your own time. Okay. But I will say this. These passages collectively highlight the importance of singing in Christian worship, encouraging believers to use their voices to praise God, teach, and encourage one another. Okay. How, why, and when should we sing? Okay. All right. So again, here are some key functions and benefits of singing as outlined in scripture. Praises and glorify God, glorifies God, builds up and encourages believers, right? Expresses joy and thankfulness, facilitates worship, communion with God, helps in scriptural, uh, sorry, spiritual, spiritual warfare, warfare and deliverance. Okay. Unites believers in worship, strengthens faith and hope. This is you know, remember, I'm trying to uh, uh, kind of give you here, you know, when should we sing? How should we sing? Why do we sing, right? These are some of the different reasons why, okay? Um, unites believers in worship, strengthens faith and hope, declares God's what? Wonders and deeds, right? One of my favorite songs is, you, you know, that God is real. When Brother Tommy sings that, it, that, that song, uh, it triggers something to me, right? I love that song. Different, uh, another song that triggers me. I come to the garden alone, right? Um, you know, uh, I got I got just different songs, family. You know, uh, woke up this morning, my mind. You know, uh, set on set on Jesus, right? There's different songs I can go through. I don't remember all of them right now, but there's different songs I can go through, family. That I'm sure like the same for you. Uh, that really what trigger you, right? And you and, and and there's some of the reasons why you sing that song, okay? So why so why sing? Praises and glorifies God, right? Builds up and encourage believers, expresses joy and thankfulness, right? Okay, just kind of do a quick recap here, all right? All right, is instrumental music a sin according to the Bible? Okay, 
The Bible does not explicitly state that instrumental music is a sin. In fact, the Old Testament contains many references to musical instruments being used in worship and praise of God, right? Now, when I say it's not a sin throughout the whole entire Bible, you're not going to see a command, right, or a prohibition against it, okay? All right? But I'm gonna but I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna explain here a little bit uh why we you know why we why we do sing a cappella, right? Okay. Here are some important considerations. Okay, old testament insights, right? These are some of the different you know uh scriptures I talked about before that's showing about that, right? Okay, about why you know why you know how instrumental music was was shown was, was sung, why instrumental music was happening back in the old testament. Okay, all right. Let's talk about the new testament, okay. The New Testament does not give specific directives about using musical instruments in worship. It what well, instead it emphasizes singing. Okay, one of the big thing I tell I tell people is that there's we don't really have, we don't have an example of instrumental music in worship. Now I know there's churches, even some churches of Christ, who are going to that. Right again, their belief theologically is that because it doesn't, it doesn't actually explicitly say that. Plus, they believe they have freedom in, in, in Christ. They can do that. That's between them and God, right? I We try to stay, again, I try to tell people, Churches of Christ and we at Central Union try to stick to the New Testament standard, right? If there's an example of it in the Bible, we'll do it, okay, right? If if something we do, because the Bible says also we can, well, there's the law of expediency, right? Right? We'll do it, right? But, you know, there's not there is not an example of anywhere in the, in the New Testament where you see uh, that. Plus, let's talk about the historical context, right? In the history, right? What we're going to talk about, you don't see any instrumental music, especially not until really the fifth century. Okay, and so you can see, you know, God, God, you know, we know God was brilliant. He was genius in using the apostles to write the New Testament. And we already know how how you know how astute Paul was. If God wanted to have an example of that in there, he could have definitely had that in there. Okay. And so again, you know, it just shows here again that what that the new Tef the new testament emphasizes that, it emphasizes what singing. Okay. Now, interpretation and tradition. This is an important thought to capture. Some Christian groups, like the Church of Christ, interpret the New Testament silence on instrumental music as a reason to practice a cappella worship without instruments. They believe that since the New Testament does not explicitly endorse instruments, they should be avoided. Okay, right? All right. Perfect capture of, of, of the wording, right? Right? Because it's right. It's not there. Okay. And, and we, again, and our goal is trying to what? Stay to what? The New Testament standard. Other denominations allow and encourage the use of instruments in worship, viewing the absence of a specific prohibition in the New Testament as freedom to include instruments as part of worship practices, right? So with their, so theologically, this is what they believe, right? They believe, okay, it's not in there. There's no prohibition against it. And because we have a liberty in Christ, according to Gal uh, Galatians 5 and 16, we can do that, right? Again, that's what, I'm just telling you the mindset, how they think, okay? Let's sum it up. The Bible does not explicitly state that instrument music, instrument music is, that, is, 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 is sinful, right? The Old Testament shows many instances of instrumental music being used in worship, while the New Testament focuses on what? Singing without addressing the use of instruments directly, okay? Different Christian denominations have varying practices and different interpretations based on their theological beliefs and traditions, okay? Were instruments used in Christian worship in the first century? Okay, good question. Um, the use of the use of musical instruments in Christian worship in the first century is not well documented in the New Testament. Early Christian worship, as recorded in the New Testament, primarily emphasizes singing and vocal praise without a specific mention of instrumental uh, accompaniment. Okay, we already talked about Ephesians five and nineteen, three sixteen. I won't go to that, but I will talk about this. Right, early Christian practices, historical evidence outside the New Testament suggests. Uh, that early Christians, particularly in the first few centuries, primarily used acapella singing in their worship. This practice might have been influenced by several factors, okay? Now, you know, the Jewish influence, right? Early Christians were heavily influenced by Jewish synagogue worship, which also featured a strong tradition of vocal music and limited use of instruments. 
especially after the destruction of the second temple, the second temple in 70 AD. Now, again, that part right there that I was doing research on, I don't know about that. But again, you know, I just wanted to put that out there as, as something that you can ponder and think on. Now, I will say this, that it does make sense that 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 when the, especially when you know uh, apostles who had had who had uh, Jewish origin and true Jew, Jewish pedigree that they would infuse some of the practices from old like for example elders elders is a old testament concept that goes all the way back mm -hmm. to Moses okay and all the different tribes had elders okay so it makes sense that that Paul would use that tradition right to infuse that and make it part of what spiritual leadership uh, in the New Testament, okay, that's as an example how you know how they could also influence, you know, in order to say incorporate, you know, synagogue practices in Christianity, right? Not all, but some, okay. Uh, persecution and simplicity. Early Christians often worship in homes and small gatherings due to perse uh, persecution. The simplicity of occupied singing may have been more practical in such settings. Some early church uh, theological concerns. Some early churches' fathers. And theologians expressed caution or disapproval of using musical instruments in Christian worship, associating them with pagan practices or fear they might distract from the spiritual focus of worship. Okay. Writings on early church, uh, I, I won't say fathers, church leaders. Uh, some, er, some early Christian writers, such as Clement of Alexandria and John Clausewitz, hinted at, at a preference for vocal music over instrumental music in worship. Their writings reflect the concern for maintaining a pure and focus a focused form of worship. Let's sum it up. Okay. While the while the New Testament emphasizes singing and does not specifically mention the use of musical instruments in early Christian worship, uh, and historical and cultural context suggests that the first century Christian worship was predominantly a cappella. Okay. And this is pretty this is pretty uh, a very uh, consensus cons uh, uh, consensus among a lot of academics and theologians that that in the first few centuries, music instruments were, no, were nowhere to be found, right? Um, what century did instruments start to be part of Christian worship? We actually asked that question. <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's do this breakdown real quick, all right? Now, let me say this. Musical instruments that gradually came in to just in general Christian worship, okay? All right? First and fourth century was predominantly a cappella, all right? Okay. Fifth to fifteenth century, the Middle Ages, we see a gradual introduction, right? Uh, the incorporation of, of instruments, particularly the organ, right? The organ was one of the big things that came first. Okay. High and late Middle Ages, that's the tenth to the fifteenth century. You have an increased use of organs, right? Okay. And then by the 12th and 13th centuries, um, you had, you know, the development of uh, polyphony, multiple independent vocal lines led to more complex musical compositions, sometimes accompanied by instruments, okay? Uh, the Council of Trent in the 16th century during the, the Counter-Reformation, the Council of Trent, 15 to 45 to 1563, addressed concerns about the clarity of the text in polyphonic music leading to reforms that balance vocal and instrumental music, okay? Then by the 16th century, we have the Renaissance and Reformation, uh, expansion of more instrumental music, right? The Reformation um, uh, influence, right? The Protestant Reformation brought various approaches to music. Martin Luther, for example, encouraged congregational singing and use of instruments, while other reformers like John Calvin preferred simpler, unaccompanied, uh, psalm singing, okay. The Baruch period, 17th to 18th century, okay. That was that was a period where it was very rich in instrumental music. All right. Okay. But I have here to sum it up, right? So again, first to fourth century, mostly a cappella. Okay. Fifth to fifteenth century, a gradual increase of instrumental music. Okay. Especially in particular, the instrument of the organ. The 16th century you have much more of an expansion during the Renaissance, uh, Renaissance period. Okay, and then the 17th, 18th century, we have a real, right, scale of rich instrumental music uh, during that Baroque period. Okay. All right, we're almost done here. 
the meaning of the word solo in Ephesians 5 and 19. Now, this Greek word uh, basically means to pluck a twain. Now, I've heard, just talking to people over the years, I've heard different people uh, give me various um, rationales and uh, explanations, illustrations, and even different interpretations of this, right? Um, overall, even though Solomon means to pluck a twain, uh, it's not saying it physically because it's talking about doing it in your heart, okay? Um, but Paul is saying there, he, when he writes this to the church of Ephesus and with Timothy, is that, you know, he wants us to, when we sing, we're making that music in our heart. So then when it comes out, it comes from our heart in the right place. When I say our heart, I'm talking about, you know, our minds, spiritual minds, okay? Um, now, the Greek, right? Originally, Sodom meant to pluck or play a string instrument such as, you know, such as a harp, okay? In the Septuagint, that's the Greek Old Testament, right? Uh, that's the Old Testament written in Greek. The term began to be used more broadly to include singing with instrumental accompaniment, right? That's in the Old Testament, okay? New Testament context. By the time of the New Testament, solo generally meant to sing praises and its instrumental connotation had diminished. In Ephesians 5 and 19, it is typically understood to mean singing and making melody in a more general sense without necessarily implying the use of instruments. So what I always tell people, say, look, I can understand he just said, you know, just, just to make melody and just left it there. But he said make melody in your heart. So to make melody in your heart, I mean, that means to start with the with the, the individual, the, the man of God, the woman of God, right? When we go to worship family before, you know, Tommy or Keith or Brian or, or you know, or Brandon or, you know, or Jerry or, or whoever going to sing, right? Right. Starts to sing, you know, I'm already plucking and twanging already in my mind. I'm ready. <laughs> right. Because what? Music, music starts with us, right? Right. It starts with us. And if it starts at the right place, this is going to come out appropriate, okay? So that's the main thing, you know, when it comes to that. And, and you know, again, interpretations by different denominations or churches, right? Because I don't consider Church of Christ a denomination. Um, you know, we already talked about the Church of Christ, right? We were, you know, we emphasize what about the New Testament, okay? All right? Um, and this is what people, we, a lot of us have said. They emphasize the New Testament does not explicitly authorize instrumental music in worship, so they avoided to adhere strict biblical instructions. Okay, now the word authorized, I, I always tell you be careful with that because there's a lot of things that we do in our worship today that and that's not that's not, that's not necessarily authorized. Okay, but but I said, but you got to be able to talk to those different things on why we do it and why not we don't do it, and the reason why we don't do it. Okay, the Eastern Orthodox Church chant and vocal music, right. Roman Catholic Church, instruments are accepted. Mainline Protestant, Protestant Church, uh, Protestant Church, Lutheran and Methodist, right? Okay. Uh, they also have that. Evangelic, uh, ev um, uh, evangelical and, and, and Pentecostal churches, right? Contemporary worship, like they, you know, they allow that, right? They, they have the instruments, okay? Uh, let's sum it up. The Greek word solo in Ephesians 19 is historically rooted in both instrumental and vocal connotations, but it's generally understood in the New Testament context, it means singing praises, okay? Different church denominations interpret this verse in light of the, their theological perspectives and worship traditions, leading to diverse practices regarding the use of the instrumental music in worship. So, in other words, as I close this out, different men, right, or different people, because of the way they approach the Bible, right, take what they want from the Bible or come, right, or they basically believe, right, uh, in their mind is right or wrong. And then from there, right, you will see a lot of times how different traditions or different things are allowed or, or not allowed in different uh, uh, di different denominations, right? And so uh, that's why I think it's important, family, as we deal with this class tonight, just going forward, right, that you, we stay with the word, we stay with the Bible, okay? If we stay with the word, we won't go wrong, all right? Now, people may ask the question, what about all the churches in Tennessee and different churches in Dallas and Houston? And going to, again, that's, if they want to, that's between them and God, right? I, I, I'm not a leader there, I don't speak for them there, okay? 
right? And you know, they're they're going off the fact that it does not explicitly say that's it's it's in the Bible. It's it's a sin. Okay, again, I, and I, and I, when people ask me about it, I say I don't see an example of it. If we're trying to stay to the New Testament standard. That's why we go about doing it. But we continue to sing, right? And also, too, I, I always add this to 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 the conversation too is that if you look at it, if you do like a good study on a lot of these different churches, especially the ones who have these instruments, right? A lot of it has become, um, it may not be the intention, but it has become more of entertainment, okay? And a lot of people down up here who lead those churches like, you know, that's all, they, if, the, if the instruments don't work, they can't even sing. Well, that's a problem, right? I would think if you should be able still to be able to sing, whether you have those things or not, right? But I've had conversations with people who have left different congregations, right, who had that, and they always said, sometimes they, they were saying that it's, you know, you know, it was a distraction for them or or that's all the people came for, right? I just think we got to be careful no matter what it is in our worship service that nobody comes, you know, for a singular purpose or a singular act, right? All the acts are important, right? Uh, but I do want to emphasize again that but that music, especially, in, you know, especially in, in New Testament worship, right, and singing is very, very important, right? It's very, very important, okay? All right, with that being said, family, um, any questions at this point? Any questions or comments? We I, I finished at seven fifty, and man, I, I still got thirty what forty minutes to ask. We almost go to eight thirty. I got forty minutes to ask questions. Let me sip on my coffee real quick. Give me a shot. <laughs> any questions? Go, go ahead, Keith. I think you're, I think you're mute, my brother. Well, Brother Brady. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, it's Brother Barkley. Okay. Uh, my question is is related to the, the use of, of the, the the praise and worship team because when I went down the east side for the uh song leader uh, workshop, yeah. Uh after we finished the morning session, the, the afternoon session, he basically talked about the use of the, the praise and worship team because they I think at East Side they actually use a praise and worship team, mm -hmm. and I was I was real keen on listening how the usage was, and it seems that they they have a praise and worship team, but they use it to like enhance the congregational singing. So it's not like in the denominational churches where they just have a praise and worship scene team that is singing to the congregation. It's like they use the praise and worship team to enhance the congregation singing. So the mm -hmm. congregation itself are, are well involved with the singing, even while the praise and worship teams are, 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 are up there singing. So I, I'll just, I'll just, uh, is 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 that a proper way to use the praise and worship team in 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 the churches of Christ? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't see an issue with it. I mean, the 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 problem we had. This is use the term praise praise teams, right? For some, that has have has a native connotation because they think you know, and I will say this in some in some of the churches, right, and in some of the denominational churches, those people just sing only, and people just watch them sing, right? right. Which is not that's that's not an actual that's not adhering to the biblical command of singing okay. for everybody. Um, it, you know, I, I don't see any problem why how East Side is using it, especially because because as long as everybody is singing, right? You know, it's it's nothing wrong with that. If you have, you know, five or six people on stage, if you have maybe five or five, six people in the front of the of the pews, right? I've seen that happen. I've seen that before as well. As long as everybody is singing, it really doesn't really matter how you really arrange your praise and worship. Okay, as long as everybody is singing. The problem uh, I think we have is that you know because you know in the Church of Christ, you know we a lot of us uh, really adhere to tradition a lot. And we gotta be careful with that because biblically there's no scripture for one song leader. So 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 if, if there's not no scripture for one song leader, right? Then it doesn't matter if it's five up there. The 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 command that we have to adhere to is everybody to be singing. You go to some churches and I, I I've seen some churches in Dallas to where you know they have I've seen people 10 people up there, right? Five people up there. I don't know, I have 10 people up there, but let's say five five people up there, right? Or four people. But everybody is singing, right? 
And I mean, everybody's, I mean, nobody's not looking around. Nobody ain't on their phone. Nobody ain't, ain't nobody on social media. Amen. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody texting. Everybody is singing. Mm -hmm. yes. And as long as everybody is singing, right, they are adhering to the command. I, I think we got to get away from trying to call it, trying to tag it, right? It's just, it's just a different, you know, East Side and other churches just have a different, have a different practice, right? And I don't have a problem with, you know, at such a unit. If, if, if we were, if most of us were good about, Having four people up there that want and they want to do that and, and they want to do it the way to where it bolsters the saint, the song and praise, and everybody is singing. That's the main thing for me. Because I don't want to do anything if nobody ain't singing, then that's a problem. I think sometimes too we lose sight of the fact we got one song leader and everybody still ain't singing. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so so that that you know, so you don't ask your question, keep no. No, I mean that what they're doing is is I mean what they're doing is fine, right? And every congregation. It's going to be now if a congregation want to have one song, one song leader, ain't nothing wrong with that, right? As long as everybody is singing, one song leader, four song leaders, doesn't matter as long as everybody is singing. So, hope I answered your question, Keith. Yeah, and, and just to add to it, Brother Brady, you know, uh, another thing that they did point out is uh, that they, they're, they're using their praise and worship team to actually uh, assist the congregation in learning new songs that they right. have have never sung before mm -hmm. so it gives them an opportunity to teach new songs whether it's an old traditional song right. or a song that that's new to this time and era so they they utilize it also as a teaching tool so i, I thought that was very yeah. interesting also that's yeah. a good point that's a good point keith and, and uh you know that's one of the things that we're working on too we're working on some what we're going we call them uh, uh, our Saturday singings, right? That we're, we're gonna have on the calendar here in the fall, to where number one, we want to, we want to working on getting brother, uh, I want brother Virgil from Cedar Valley to come down and help with the song leaders, but also we as a congregation, you know, I, you know, we we've already been working on our worship, but you know, we want to also, I want to make sure also we as a congregation, we work on our singing because I mean, this this, I'm gonna tell you something, family, you know. Singing can attract people just like preaching can, and in some cases even more, right? And so, and and I was talking to one of the preachers recently, and he was saying, "Man, he said these young people, you know, you like these 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 other churches, these the churches who are growing like crazy. They're growing for two reasons: they got an outstanding singing program, and they got an outstanding youth program. And those things, those things are real, right? So, so yeah, so I, I think it's great, keep that they they do that, and, and that's something, Lord willing, that you know, prayerfully." We can get to too, right? That to where, hey, we may start these Saturday singers, and from there, whether it be a few people from from CU singers or Central Harmony or whoever, right, come together and form some type of uh, praise ministry, a praise team, whatever, uh, that helps the congregation to sing right. That'd be a great thing, okay. But again, my emphasis again is just making sure that we we adhere to doctrine, and the doctrine is no matter how many people we have up there, one or one, two or three. Or whoever, right? Or or none, <laughs> right? As long as we singing, that's the main thing. So. Well, well, uh, well, brother Brady. Along those lines, uh, wouldn't the functions of the uh, the Levites in the Old Testament be consi consistent with that idea of of people who are skilled in singing? to lead and teach the congregation. And I almost hesitate to do that because, you know, uh, I noticed that you um, you included some uh, Old Testament passages uh, to show the uh, benefits and, and uh, yeah, the benefits of, uh, of singing. And you use some Old Testament passages. You know, and some would argue, well, you can't go to the Old Testament and get passage about singing and then say, well, you can't use musical instrument in the New Testament. But uh, the Old Testament does affirm that. Uh, but I just wanted to get your feelings. I didn't want to go off on a tangent like that. But I wanted to get your feelings on the function of the Levitical priest in terms of leading uh, God's people in worship and maybe, um, you know, I don't know if they have soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, but I can definitely see and I've experienced the benefit of having a congregation taught, you know, the various parts of a mm -hmm. song to enhance the sound. So, right. that, uh, you know, it's more melodic and uh, we, we're, we're sending up something to God that sounds good to God, well, and but also to the audience uh, who may be online, uh, in addition to those in the building. Right, right. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, 
No, yeah, I, I definitely get why people would, would feel that way. And that's why I wanted to, to distinguish the two as far as, you know, when we look at how was music, how would how was it permanent in worship in the old testament? Mm-hmm. And how was it how was it viewed right in the new testament? That's why I want to make that distinction, right? Yeah. Um, going back to the old testament, you're right. The Levites were considered spiritual leaders, and they did they had multiple functions. Now, sometimes they were called to come and lead, you know, you know, help lead service, right? Or in some passages of the old testament, come and really stand out, kind of inspire, you know, the congregation, right? To lead. Uh, I do also know too in Chronicles, Second Chronicles 2018, how when Jehoshaphat was fighting against uh that army, right? God had told him to bring his best singers <laughs> and put them at the forefront. And so we know that music ministry is a concept that goes back to the old testament, right? So some churches have a um have a, a music minister, right? I know the the King's Church up in New York, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, Jason Walker, brother brother Walker, right? He uh, he's their music minister, right? They got one song leader, but they practice all the time. They sound good, right? Yeah. So again, the main thing, family, to me is that you know, just how can we you know improve ourselves first as a congregation to sing? I, I don't even care about the song leaders right now. How as a congregation can we improve our singing? Mm-hmm. Because you know we, we we'll be shocked that how much we can improve when we start working on it, right? Because we are a young congregation, right? Uh, Ebrochian congregation, but at the same time, there's room to grow for us to grow when it comes to, to singing. So I hope I asked you a question, my brother. Charlotte, did you have a question, sister? I'm sorry, I saw your hand. I have a question. Yeah. Um, could you just please clarify if both uh, men and women are permitted to uh, participate in praise and worship team doing uh, corporate worship. That's a great. That's a great. That's a great question, right? That's a great question. So I have heard. I've I've seen both sides. Okay, and then I, I'll give you the answer. Okay, I've heard some saying that because because this even also goes into communion, right? What sisters can't, you know, you know, be hand out communion or, or be or a lead communion, right? Um, this is this this is this is how I see it, right? So if you have Say you have uh, a couple of guys up there and, and, and two sisters up there, right? And the and the music person who's leading is over that minute, that particular ministry at that point, right? I believe because then it's been led by, you know, uh, by a brother that you're good, right? But if you had all sisters in that case, right, right? That may be that that may I can see how people may have a problem with that. Now that's now again this is in, to your point. This is in public worship. Now this is during a fellowship, right? Outside of public worship, then nobody wouldn't care. Okay, you said all the time, all whole sister quartet singing, right, leading the song because it's not in public worship. But adhering to the command of public worship, right? We know that Paul was very explicit to Timothy. That we have, you know, that usurp of authority, right? I would, I would have, I would have a couple of guys up there and have the guy say, "Hey, that four, you go at four or five, and go up there. You need to be leading that group. You're leading that particular ministry, right? Okay, a sister can be up there with you, but you're leading that ministry, right? We have sisters today who lead, who coordinate different ministry teams, but deacons are overall over that ministry. That's what they report to, okay? Mm-hmm. And so. So yeah, so to your point, sister, I this yeah, I, I wouldn't have all sisters up there, right? And if I didn't have sisters up there, I would make sure that there be brothers up there who be leading that that ministry, so you can say that they're leading that particular part, and then you won't have that have that issue. Okay, hope that answers your question, sister. Um, yes, it does answer my question, and I'm glad you put emphasis on you know uh, saying that. One, um, a man has to be the lead of that ministry because I have seen at different churches of Christ, like in the South, where you'll have someone that's over the music ministry. But sometimes I've seen where it has been a woman and not a brother. And so I just wanted to get some clarification on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's a good question, too, because right now, like for, you know, for the CU singers, right, sister, you know, Sister White, she you know she she leads that she coordinates, she leads that ministry, but basically, you know, she leads that to within the construct of how the congregation and the spiritual leadership 
right? We we support her in that, right? So basically, you know, when she, if she needs something, she'll come talk to us, right? She reports to us if there's a thing, right? If we, when there's elders in place, right, she'll report to them, right? She can coordinate and lead that group all day long, right? As long as she's working with you know a spiritual leader who can you know not only assist her and support her in that group, but also too, right? You know, we we are trying to adhere to 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 that command, right? That hey, you know, we're trying to make sure. And plus, also to them to say like this, it's unfortunate though that that even outside of public worship, right? That 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 group is that, that she does that group, right? Um, technically, because it's, it's it's out of public worship, is really nothing wrong with that. But you just do things right because it's just expedient sometimes to do those things. You don't want to cause, um, you know unnecessary controversy right because you know sometimes this means this is be real family you have people who still ain't satisfied with that yeah <laughs> yeah so sometimes it's just good to just to do those things right but no she does an excellent job right and really is it's outside of public worship but again it's just, it's sometimes it's speedy to do those things just to make sure that we have our bases covered but that's a great question so if you're right there are different congregations who view that different so does somebody else have a question I think Les, you had a question, right? Oh, you just put here, you put a thought here. James 5 and 13, is, any, is he any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Uh, let, let him sing psalms. Amen. That's right. Uh, uh, Brother Brady, I just wanted to ask you, is that really a sound biblical argument? And I heard you say that uh, you uh, we argue uh, from silence that the Bible does not uh, authorize, and I hate to use the word you said we shouldn't, but... Uh, we got to be careful about using that word, but there's no explicit uh, command to play uh, instrumental music. So uh, we argue from silence. And what strengthens that argument is the fact that uh, instrumental music was not used for the first 400 years right. of the church's history. Now, those two together would seem to be a very strong argument against adding it to um, the practice which has been set has a 400 year precedent. A 400 year precedent uh, is a long period of time. Uh, biblically, uh, 40 years was all it was needed to uh, establish something that uh, was credible. You know, uh, uh, what, 40 days? Jesus was uh, mm -hmm. post resurrection, seen 40 days. You know, the, uh, the rain uh, receded off of the earth, uh, what, after 40 days? Mm -hmm. so, uh, there's a significant uh, period of time to say that if God had wanted uh, us adding instrumental music to the church, he would have done it in the first century. So why is that not prohibitive uh, to others uh, who uh, add mu instrumental music to the church? Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, that's a great question. You know, it, it goes along with that when you look at the history of religion in general, right? Um, well, you're talking about Eastern Orthodox, you're talking about the Mormons, you're talking about the, the Jehovah Witnesses, right? You're talking about uh, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Lutheran. I go on about different religious denominational organizations, right? A lot of them have been started by men who didn't like something that was already in place. Yeah. Islam is a reaction to Christianity 600 years later, <laughs> right? So, so. Uh, a lot of it, and it's unfortunate. Cause I know Mrs. White. We have this great conversation. She, you know, she's right about this. She, and uh, this is it. Bugs her. I don't like different, all these different interpretations. I get it, sister. They had different interpretations, even Jesus' time, <laughs> right? The Pharisees believe in the angels and the resurrection. The Sadducees did not, right? Mm -hmm. So we can go on and on about how different interpretation has plagued the history of man, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to your to your point. Um, I think I think it's just that, you know, when it comes to the Bible, people have a tendency to say, you know what, I want to do things. I want to do things my way and not really God's way. People like that, unfortunately. Right. I want to do it differently, you know, or I hear this a lot. Yeah, but I don't see how that's I don't see it anywhere in the Bible at all. And so in New Testament. So that means I can I can do it. A lot of times people don't do deeper dives or do more uh more uh, deeper biblical study yeah. to see if they're right or wrong one of the things i wouldn't challenge you know not just myself and also in the congregation is that you know whenever you're not sure about something right 
it should it should behoove us as Christians to really to do to go to do much more under the hood study to see if I'm right on this. There have been times when I call preachers, you know, and, and not sure about something, torn because um, that's right. They, they, they did, I, yeah, they, they they did not. I know. Um, you know, they, they be they 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 be torn and. Um, you know, on, on, you know, on things. And sometimes people just say, you know, I'm just going, I'm just going to choose to do it this way, no matter what. Right. I have talked to people who in different congregations, you know, they're doing wrong and don't even care. Right. Because they, they getting paid money. They, they get the check. And you know, let's, let's be real family. When you get a check, sometimes it make you do things you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, uh, uh, and so basically, um, we as humanity, we 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 have a history, we have a track record, uh, Cecil, of you know God was to say one thing, we do another. Look, look at Israel, how they had the law, right? They were chosen. How many times they choose Baal, right? How many times they choose Dagon? How many times did they choose the Philistines' God, right? Right? Because why? They wanted something different. Okay, and that's why. That's why we have all this 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 really interpretations and different flavors, I call them, of religion because people want something different. It's, all, it's an old cliche. If you want to drink, be a Catholic or be a Baptist. You want to show out, be a, you want to show out and dance, be a Pentecostal, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so you know, it, you know, you just choose whatever, you know, you think that, it's, that, that you want to get involved with. But I always say, what happened to New Testament Christianity? One of the things I, I would always encourage you on, family, we got to be proud of who we are. Right. I tell people who ask me questions about well, what or what or what's so different about y'all? Why do I gotta get baptized again? I said, because I'm gonna tell you something. Here's the question you got to ask yourself, right? Right. Whatever you came out of, right, were they doing everything possible to mimic New Testament standard and New Testament Christianity? Right. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, right? Right. God makes it at the end of the day, right? Hey, you know, all y'all. And I, I'm gonna give amnesty to those who weren't doing everything right, and those who were doing everything right, y'all definitely gonna go come in, right? But I rather I rather do it the way that God says that he, he wanted it done versus taking a chance. Mm -hmm. Y'all with me, family? Taking a chance, right? If I got two roads to get to, to the to the cabin, one road says you go you go that way, you may get there 60% chance you might not have any issues. You go the other way, it's a it's 99 percent guaranteed. Which road y'all gonna take? <laughs> yeah. I'm taking the 99 percent road, right? And that's what I share with people who come out of different churches. I say, look, you have you have the opportunity right now to get yourself spiritually aligned in New Testament Christianity. Come on now, what's, what's better than that? Yeah. Right, right. And, and, and I'm gonna tell you something, pal. We shouldn't have to change or adhere and do gimmicks. Right or, or 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 do things to try to get people uh, to come. Right, we shouldn't have to, uh, you know, uh, change doctrine. When I say gimmicks, yeah. change doctrine to include include gimmicks to do it. No, no, no. We stay with doctrine, right? No matter what we do, no matter how we sing, no matter we show video announcements, that doesn't matter, right? Do we stick with the doctrine? And that's yeah. the main thing. Do we preach to one church? And so, yeah. So that's that's the thing, my brothers, that. You know, I, I think people are just choosing, and it shows over history that when they don't like something right, they do something different. And think about this, Paul. Paul, he dealt with the Gnostics and Colossians, right? They 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 believe that knowledge is more important than serving God. He dealt with the the the, uh, the Genosis, the ones who believe that that uh, you have to worship angels and cut on yourself that the body was a problem. You had to do the time of the gospel. Different people preaching different things, right? Who in their right mind want to worship angels? Yeah. Who in their right mind want to cut on themselves, right? But you had it back then where a man would deviate, yeah, even though the gospel was at play, it was there. So, so uh, and just to kind of follow behind it, and, and maybe we shouldn't even discount the role of Satan. Oh, absolutely. Wanting to create division among those who would, uh, you know, follow Christ. Uh, one yep. of the things that appealed to me uh, when I was first exposed to the uh, Church of Christ coming out of a Methodist tradition, Methodist slash Baptist, I grew up in a religiously divided house and it caused a lot of uh, dissension between my parents, uh, was that uh, 
we speak where the Bible speak and we're yeah. silent where the Bible is silent. And right. when I read uh, 1 Peter 4, 11, it says that if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And I think right. it's so important to have consistency uh, of speech uh, when we are talking about religious things. We call things by Bible names. Um, and I was looking uh, at that uh, entomology of the word silo. And I saw that in classical uh, Greek, you had it up there. But in Koine Greek, it, it seems to limit that verb silo to just uh, singing. Yeah. So to me, that would be a, a, a strong argument for uh, instrumental music in the church. But um, that, that, that verb has uh, morphed over the years. Uh, it has, it, you know, uh, experienced some semantic changes, you know, the adding of plucking and playing when exclusively in the coin a Greek, it was play. It wasn't, it, that was not added. It was just to sing. Yeah, and it makes sense though, because remember, the Septuagint is basically rewriting in what Greek was already there, right? Yeah. So, so basically, the old the Hebrew Bible, right, or the Old Testament or the Torah was already there. They just what translated into Greek, right? And so the wordplay would be the, 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 you know that solo would have a variation. Because remember, you can have different uh, verbs and nouns and and and. and first person, second person way Greek is done. And so we think about Greek, right? It would make sense that they would have to have a variation of the word to kind of what, make sure they show that instrument of music was yeah. there in the, in the Old Testament. But remember, but remember when they start writing the, the New Testament, right? Using, like you said, Coney Greek, it's different now, why? Because now they're emphasizing what the practice, what they want to do yeah. in the New Testament. Yeah, so so that's, the, so that's why, that's a good point because some people say, well, yeah, but in the Greek, in, in the Septuagint, they wrote, yeah, but it, it is, they're, just, they're just translating to the Greek what is already there, right? Right. But when Paul and the apostles were writing in the New Testament, they made sure, and that's why I would tell people, you know, if God God used holy men inspired by God, the, God, the word of God was written by what word and inspiration. Mm -hmm. So if God wanted something in their family, he would have it there. Come on now, we did it with a brilliant God. We ain't did it with a dumb God. <laughs> You know, God, he, if he wanted something there, that's why I would tell people, I said, you know, somebody said, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell me, man, it's more books. The God gave us enough for salvation, right? He knows what he's doing, okay? He knows exactly what he's doing. We, we're not even on the same intellect level when it comes to him. He knows exactly what he's doing, family, right? But uh, but no, that's that, that's that's a great thing. Now, now, I guess on the call, I guess my question to anybody, right, is how many, how many times have we heard that, right? Why y'all don't have instruments in y'all worship? <laughs> right? You know, I, I've heard somebody tell me, you know what? I come on down if I had a guitar. <laughs> right? Yeah, I tell them, I say, look, you 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 can't you can't talk about acapella music to church. You gotta experience it. Right. I tell people all the time, when you experience it, it's another thing. I remember in uh KZI is a is a known uh African American radio station in Austin. And one of the guys, he was a, a, a preacher for a Baptist church, and uh, they had a he had to go to I think a funeral at the Fifth, fifth Board Church of Christ, and uh, he went to the he went I'll get you less give me a second he he went there and he came back in the radio and said man he said I went to a Church of Christ uh, uh, a church uh, for for a funeral and let me tell you them folks can sing. <laughs> He said, I have never heard a cappella arrangement done like that. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing to talk about it, but when you've been around it, it's a whole other ball game. Go ahead, Les, you had something? Well, on that about uh, singing with other groups and such, uh, the two times I was stationed in Korea, uh, there was a missionary, Church of Christ, that would come on to base there at Yongsan, for Sunday uh, worship as well as uh, Wednesday evening Bible study. And sometimes we get the opportunity to go with him to the local Korean congregation where he preached at. And to hear the singing of Koreans and non-Koreans singing in their own languages was day. absolutely amazing that... 
even though they were singing different the same hymn in different languages it was absolutely beautiful yep amen amen yeah it, it's funny because you know if you ever go to like um they'll have like different youtube videos like church of christ in indonesia church of christ in jamaica right church of christ in africa saying the same song but boy it sounds good <laughs> it sounds good and, not, and when they say it sometimes they say it in english or in their own language right it sounds wonderful and again that's why I say, think about it, family, the simplicity of this singing. We don't, we don't have to worry about trying to, uh, you know, because some people sometimes, right, they, they can they can get tired of having instruments, right? And then think about it, too, it can become a distraction, right? You know, and just it's just, it just, I understand why they emphasize, you know, uh, you know, singing, right, to praise God in the New Testament. It makes sense to me, you know. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I first grew up in the church, right, I didn't understand it fully. I had to do research, I had to study. But I can tell you, over the last 10 years, just read, just, you know, studying the Bible, right, getting more into God's Word, and also doing heavy research. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me now, right, why, you know, they chose that that practice, right, to really kind of get into that. And, you um, I know, I, I know. I put out that you know different reasons that that, that may, may may have thought why they want to just stick with singing. Well, I just think that you know it just makes sense, right? It's, it's simple, it's beautiful, right? And uh, and and it really resonates in the worship. So, well, also two more things is uh, one is of course Gabby is speaks Spanish, and a lot of the hymns she knows, she sings in Spanish. So sometimes here at the house or while we're traveling. She'll start singing in Spanish, and I'll recognize the hymn, and I'll start singing in in English with her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we also have the example of Jesus because it talks several times in scriptures where they went out and sang hymns. They didn't say they went out and played. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's overwhelming evidence about that, you know. Uh, like to, to see some point, 400 years, right, of acapella singing. That's a long time. That's a long time, right? And then somebody had to bring in an organ. You know, it's funny. Out of all the, the least favorite instruments out there, I'm just not big on organs. <laughs> um, I, I never had. I, I, I say the, the, the piano, the piano's cousin is terrible. <laughs> and for those who may not know, may I explain this? Septuagint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Go explain it. Yeah. Um, after Alexander the Great died, uh, he had uh, conquered a huge amount of territory, mm -hmm. and is broken up amongst his four generals. Well, General Tal Ptolemy got the Saudi Arabian Peninsula uh, all the way up into Jordan, up uh, next to Syria, and over into Egypt. And so, all the different nations that were under his command. Uh, or under his control at that point, he wanted to have their religious books as well as their histories and different other uh, poetry and things of that nature mm -hmm. translated to Greek so that they could be put in the library in Alexandria and also everybody could share in it under the Greek language. And that's where the Septuagint came in is when he gave that order, the Israelites the Levites and stuff did that translation of the Hebrew into Greek. And so it's those documents that we have the Septuagint. Amen. Amen. No, no great, great explanation, Les. And, you know, and, and, but Les, you know, we, we just talking about the Septuagint. I, I think I've told y'all church from about the, you know, about the, you know, the origins of the KJV, the King James version, the, I like to call it the authorized version, but you know, that five-year process that they did, right, the Septuagint was part of that because what I like about it is that they went to the main manuscripts, right, and they also checked the different books to make sure that everything was aligned and also bringing in Hebrew scholars. And they did it for five years. That's powerful, family. You know, you know, this is a little history in the King James Version, right? It took five years to do it. Why? Because they brought in 70 scholars. It's a lot of scholars. Just to make sure that their writings were correct, right? So, um, it's eight twenty-three. Family, we got seven more minutes. Who else has a question? 
Good, good stuff tonight. Good stuff tonight. Anything I need to we need to have a question on any comments before we close out. Okay. You you on mute, uh, Cecil Carter? Do you have something? I think you on mute too, Carter. I let go ahead go ahead and let Carter, but I've been running my okay. mouth. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Carter. You you know uh, I've had the experience to uh, go to Laura Street Church of Christ in San Antonio. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And man, and they have. You know, you have uh, black Hispanics there, and uh, and to hear them sing, it's a man. I'm talking. About, it's the experience that you know that you never will forget. And um, and everybody, and everybody there be singing. You know, uh, and I, I mean, if you ever get a chance to go to San Antonio, you know, everybody to go to Dale Crest. But just go over there and listen to them sing, and you know, and they singing, and you know they 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 singing. The whole church one Sunday they'll sing in English. The next Sunday they'll sing in Spanish. And man, that's a that's phenomenal. I you know I've I've experienced that several times when my daughter was in the in the hospital there. You know, so I mean, mm, it, okay. it, it, I mean it, it's. It, man, it's mind boggling. And I also want to note about uh about, about uh, uh all this uh this this the way that way some of the churches are doing with these uh different uh praise teams or whatever they wanna call themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we have to realize that each and every congregation is autonomous to the other one. Mm -hmm. And they can do whatever they wanna do, you know. But you know, but as for what I what I what I what I'm trying to say, you know, I'm just you know, I brought I brought up the spirit of Christ when the old preacher used to say things like this will go happen. And mm -hmm. it's happening now. And you gotta be careful where you go because it, it's so man, it, it, they got so much stuff out there now, man, you know, it's unbelievable. And you really got to be a student of the word of God. To distinguish the truth from the power because it's yet so close, but it's yet so far. That's mm. all I got to say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And I appreciate it, my brother. Appreciate that. Did Cecil, do you have one more thing for me? Are you good? Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else? It's 826. Make your four minute question quick. <laughs> Sister White, you good? What? What? Mama, you don't have no questions? What? Okay. All right. Go, go ahead, Cecil. You, you, you on, uh, you on mute, Cecil. Oh, unless you're talking to somebody. Okay. Hey, Cecil, you, you on mute. Yeah, I, I, you know, we kind of touched on a little earlier in this discussion about Sister Wright's uh, uh, role in the congregation. And and I think that we need to, uh, I just want to say publicly how much I appreciate her role, uh, because I understand outside of the walls of our congregation, sometimes as a woman, and even though uh, you have described the process by which she leads us, and I don't want to speak for you, Sister White, but I do, I do understand that you do still get friction because there are some very conservative uh people in in our mm -hmm. fellowship i mean mm -hmm. even to the extent that you know she's apprehensive about using the pitch pipe and so uh i know she's probably doing a very delicate dancing act and i know you get affirmed by a lot of the other people but i also know uh that there's some uh, tension underlying your role and I just want to let you know that I appreciate the way you carry yourself, the way you lead the group. And uh, I just pray that God will continue to bless the CU singers that we can just grow and develop. Amen. Uh-oh. Would you say, did you say, Sister White, we didn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just the iPhone. 
Um, thank you for your support, uh, Brother Agabo. I appreciate um, those comments. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah, we, heard, we heard you. Perfect. Amen. Okay, Amen. I want to say, family, uh, uh, thank you all for the for the, your, your comments and your uh, your patience tonight, your listening. I really appreciate that. I've already sent the lesson to everybody, but if you did not get it, please let me know, and I will send to you directly from my phone if the system didn't get it to you, okay? But everybody should have a link to the lesson. Also, too, I got to uh, find out how, what these recordings are, too, so I can put them on the church website. That way, people can also, too, be able to uh, get to these um, dynamic discipleship classes, right? Amen. And so I believe these are great tools for learning, but but this would not happen, family, if you guys, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, were not able to come on and really uh, be a part of, of these class sessions and really contribute, uh, not only listening, but also uh, your, your commentary, and your discourse is, is, makes a difference too. So again, family, I want to say thank you. And then we're going to end out on a prayer. We're going to ask Brother Les to go ahead and close us out in a prayer right now. Pray with me, please. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the work that you've let us do, for taking us through our travel safely, for letting us be here and use this technology to learn more of your word, Lord, to understand what it is that you want us to do, especially so that we can worship you and praise you in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask that we can take in this lesson and apply it in our lives and help to teach others the more perfect way to worship and serve you, Father. Watch over us through this night. Give us the rest that we need, Father, and if it be your will to allow us to wake and see a new day. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, thank y'all, family. Appreciate y'all. Y'all be blessed. Great prayer, Les. Thank you, my brother. Thank Good night. Be blessed, You're family. Welcome. Be blessed. Good night. Be blessed. Amen.